Welcome to episode 13 of CASCAST. Today on the podcast, we welcome author Stephen Morley to talk about the release of his new book, Too Old to Ultra. Those of you that have read Stephen's previous book, uh, Running with a Wounded Heart, which was released in 2013, will know what an inspirational guy Stephen is. And today, uh, myself and Stephen are going to be talking about his journey from sort of his early beginnings in in running uh, to the present day up until his training that he's completing at the minute, um, his ultra marathons and his new book that's coming out, uh, Too Old to, to Ultra. So yeah, thanks for coming on, Stephen. I really appreciate it. No problem, Callum. Great to be here. Good. Um, so for those uh, sort of listeners who haven't read your first book, um, so Running with a, a Wounded Heart, could you tell us a little bit about the book? Yeah, sure. Well, it- I've always loved writing, uh, even from a little lad. I used to love writing essays and poems, and, and I used to keep a diary from a very early age. So I've always liked writing, but and I've always like dreamt of the idea of writing a book. Uh-huh. Um, but, you know, uh, everybody will, will sort of tell you, you know, you know, you can't really write until you've got something to say. Yeah. And um, and I found myself in a place, uh, I was actually working, and, and there was a chance that I might be made redundant, Okay. And and I started thinking, well, okay, what what kind of stuff can I do? And I thought, well, yeah. now would be a good time to write write the book. And I thought, well, okay, well, what's happened to me recently <laughs> that I can write about? And yeah. my wife said to me, well, look, you, you you love running. Why don't you write a book about your running? And you can tell them about how you had a heart attack. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, well, that's yeah that that could be a good book that could be a story yeah. somebody might be interested in that so that's really how it came about okay yeah no i mean like you say i imagine people um i mean it was really successful and people do find it interest interesting just in general people do love a you know a comeback story don't they well i think the thing that's interesting is when it, when i wrote it it was the first time i'd i'd written a you know a full length book and yeah. and i got various people to critique it for me mm-hmm. and most people who read it enjoyed it and thought it was good but one particular guy <laughs> he gave me a quite a harsh critique really right. and um and that kind of prompted me to do a, almost a bit of a little of a rewrite and and to kind of tidy it up a little bit because okay. what he said was really interesting he said he said why would somebody buy your book mm-hmm. and he said okay if you're like mo farah your book can be really poor but people are going to read it because you're mo farah you're yeah. famous yeah so but you're not mo farah you're not a famous runner Okay, so but you're just an ordinary runner. But are you an ordinary runner that's done something extraordinary? So have mm-hmm. you run from Land's End to John O'Groats or something else? Is that's that's something extraordinary that makes it worthy of your reading? No. I are, are you a very old person? So you, Mr. Singh, he's a hundred years old. He's just you know just uh, finished his umpteenth marathon at hundred yeah. years old. No, you know, you're, you're just a man in your 50s. Lots of people in their 50s run marathons, in their 60s run marathons, their 70s run marathons. So there's nothing there. What's your story? Well, your story is, you know, you're an average guy who took up running and then had a heart attack while you were running a race. And you got over it and you got back on the bike and you, you started running again and you, you took care of your recovery. Well, there's a story there. There's a story there that people can relate to. So. Yeah stick to the story don't go off at a tangent um, yeah you don't need to just it's, it's to powerful story. enough on yeah, its own yeah yeah i made the mistake with the very first draft of thinking i need to talk more about lots yeah. more stuff mm-hmm. um, so i put in training plans and yeah. you know all kinds of stuff you know and my editor just basically threw all that out and just to just stick to the story yeah which 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 is the book that's out now that that's yeah. basically just it now I'm guessing everyone has, um, you know, their own style of, of, of writing. Um, you know, when you know you get an idea for writing a book and you think, well, I've got to make a start somewhere. Mm-hmm. How did that process for you go for, um, you know, writing your first book? Was it a lot more challenging than you thought? And and who did you bring on board to help you? And how did that process look like? The the process of writing I found very easy. I actually sat down with a notebook and a pencil. And I just sat and I wrote it out freehand, mm. um, and then, then I sat down at a computer and started retyping it. And in in the in the course of retyping it, I rewrote various bits, um, and so it was a bit sort of making notes and then writing, and making notes and writing. But I've always been quite good 
with my own self-discipline, I, I spent a lot of my working life, life self-employed, so working from home. And, um, I, you know, I never have a problem working from home. I was, I was never one of these people that, OK, I'm supposed to be working, but I'm watching daytime television or drinking cups of coffee. I used to... It was a running joke in the wintertime because my wife used to go off to Cambridge and in daylight and she'd come home and every, all the house would be in darkness yeah. because I'd be still upstairs in my room and <laughs> yeah. it got dark and I hadn't come down yeah. to turn any lights on. Yeah. So she always used to joke, you know, to come home in the dark <laughs> because I'd just be focused on my work. Yeah. So I never had a problem with that. Once, once I'm in the groove, I can sit and write for hours and hours and hours. I'm never one of these people that like stare at a blank, a blank screen yeah. or, or, or stare at a blank sheet of paper. And, and as I've, I mean, I wrote that first book, I've got this second one about to come out and I've got two other books in various stages. And so, you know, I, I, I do a lot of preparation, so I do a lot of research uh, and I, I, I do a, quite a thorough outline for my book. So when I'm ready to sit down and write, um, it's, it's kind of all there for me. I've, I've yep. just got to kind of pad it out a little bit and, you know, and, and extrapolate some bits. Yep. And, you know, I haven't got to kind of make it up as I go along. Mm -hmm. And I think that's came from my training as a designer because, you know, I never set out a Mac and, you know, just designed from scratch. I always, like, you know, did scamps and did scribbles and things. And, and that was my design process. And then... Mm -hmm once i kind of knew where i was going with the design then i'd sit down at the mac and start actually mm -hmm. producing it yeah so i take the same kind of process to to writing really yeah. and that works really well brilliant so would you say it was quite a, a therapeutic sort of process talking about all of this i mean putting that down uh, you know on paper and actually writing it out in words um and you know sort of how proud what was you with that final product you know were you really shocked about wow this is you know this is an amazing piece that I've built up here I mean how did you feel about it once it had been complete or are you the sort of person that feels like it's still not quite right yeah yeah, yeah. it's just I'm, not I, you no, feel like I, you could made it a little bit better yeah, or a little I, bit better. I, I I'm, I'm I, I was the same with my design right I'm just really critical and if left to my own devices I'd be like painting the fourth bridge mm. I could never <laughs> be like a, a, a fine artist because I'd never finish any artwork. <laughs> Nothing you to know, get done. The only yeah. thing that used to make me finish my design work was deadlines. Yeah, you know, ha it has I have to, to leave be done. it now so yeah. because it, okay. needs, it needs to go to print. So from start to finish, how long did that book sort of take you to write? If um, you can remember. Well, I had my heart attack in 2010, yeah. and I published the book in 2013. Um, and from the time of writing it, it to the time I got it published, yeah. maybe about six or seven months. Okay. Uh, in total, yeah. Um, but these later ones are taking are taking me longer because I'm, 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 I'm doing more research and 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 also I'm. You know, you had that story to tell, and and now you. It's a bit like when people write a bestseller. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people only write one, don't they? Yeah. And then the, their next books are not as good. Yeah. It's, it's almost like they've only got one bestseller in them. So, for me, it's like too old to ultra. Is, is a story and, and there's, yeah. there's a story to tell there yeah. and the next one after that is still about running but it's more about general getting older and yeah. achieving things and that's called running out of time it's got a new it's got a new spine to it it's, like it's got a new core yeah. like, and, and yeah. at the centre but, but yeah. for me for me it's, it's, it's got to be authentic a lot of people who yeah because, because you got to be true to yourself well it? because publishing is so easy now you know, years ago, you had to find a publisher, and those people can self-publish now. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy to do. And so the consequences of that is you can you can really just turn out any rubbish yeah. and just get it out there. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, you see lots of books on on writing, don't you? And 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 it's like pile them high and sell them cheap. So the like the more the more books you get out there, it's mm -hmm. like selling encyclopedias. If you if you knock on enough doors, you'll sell encyclopedias. Yeah. I'm not I'm not interested in that. It doesn't really bother me if if one person buys my book or if a hundred people buy it. I'm, yeah. I'm, as long as I'm happy with it and I think that it, it it's true to me and it tells a story. Yeah. And it mean really means something yeah, to you. If it helps. If it's you know it's it's like a cliche, isn't it? But yeah. if it helps one person, You're if one happy. person says. Do you know what? I, I was really unfit, 
And I thought, well, I just can't run at my age or, yeah. you know, with my weight or something. But I read your book and I, I started jogging and I started running and I've lost so many pounds and I, I run, you know, I get out twice a week now and run and I, yeah. you know, and I, it was all because I read your book. Well, that's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah, you know? brilliant. Yeah. And what has the response been like since well, the book come out? What? Really positive, really yeah. positive. I mean, it's available on Amazon and... And I think all the reviews I've had recently have all been five star reviews, Brilliant. which great. which is really n nice. And 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 people say really nice things about it. And yeah. and um, and and that's great. But as I say, I'm I'm not happy with it. And so a lot of the things that I'm not happy about, I want to make sure that when I, this next one that comes out, yeah. it, it, it's better still. And in book three and book four, you it, always yeah. want to be improving. Well, it's like yeah. everything. You you learn your craft. Yeah, it's the for first sure. thing is to have a story to tell and. If you've got a story to tell, that's the most important thing. It doesn't yeah. matter how how ham fisted it is or how rough it is, if there's a story there, the story will come out. Yeah. Um if you're just making it up as you go along, then it doesn't work. But the story can be really rough and then after that you, you learn the craft, like yeah. anything. You, you you learn how to be a better writer and that's and that interests me in itself, you know. Yeah. Um the first book, for example, the way I wrote it was just all linear. It was like this happened, that happened. Then I had my heart attack. Then I did this, this, and this. Yeah. And the editor that I got in to help me, um, she chopped it up. So she did a sort of backwards and forwards. So, mm, but so that's a skill in itself, exactly. knowing when to go back, knowing when to go yeah. forward, and progress the, you know, the, the story. Yeah. It's like Quentin Tarantino's films. That when you first watch them, they're really complicated yeah. because it's forwards and backwards, yeah. and you know, a character. Um, you know, a character dies at the start and then all of a sudden he's in it in the middle yeah. and it goes back yeah. and it gets really confusing. But once you get that and understand it and you get to the end, well, to me it, it was, makes it even better. To me, it was, yeah. it was you know, counterintuitive. And I, I kept saying to her, how will they know when they read chapters? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't make like, sense. This is, this is you running a marathon. How will they know if that was a marathon I ran before my heart attack or after my heart How will they know? Right. Should I put little dates on it? You know, like doing yeah. movies. Where yeah, like, just you in watch brackets. a bit of a movie and it says five years earlier yeah, or something like yeah, that should right. I put in and she said no you don't need to do any you don't need to give them clues they will start reading it and they will, they will see it right, will become okay. apparent and nobody has said that nobody has said to me oh I found that confusing yeah it, and com but but lots of people have said oh I quite like the way it went backwards and forwards yeah I thought that made it really easy to read people uh, yeah because it's then it, it's easier to break down into sections I guess yeah. Yeah. Um, and also it just keeps people on their toes a little bit and makes it interesting. Yeah. So, brilliant. Well, that sounds great. So, we've definitely given people a nice introduction there. So, um, if you're happy to, I think what might be good is if um, you read like the, the the preface for the um, you know the first book, yeah. um, and we'll, so people can get a bit of a feel of it, mm -hmm. um, and then you can read a few extracts. Um, I'll ask some questions along the way, yeah, and uh, good. just to give people a really good sort of understanding of the book and yeah, yeah, and then your story that you want to tell. Excellent. So when you're ready, just just go ahead, Stephen. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it kind of book starts off um, with with the event, mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the the big event, the the heart attack, and yeah. and it happened in um, the 14th of November, 2010, <laughs> a day that's etched in my memory. Yeah. Um, and the race was the scenic seven in Stowmarket. Okay. In in, uh, in Suffolk, yeah. Um, and I'll dive straight into the uh, roughly about uh, a third of the way into the preface, and it says, "The hill was steep, but it didn't go on for that long. But once over the top, the going gets easier, and you have a nice run into the finish." Seeing a group of runners about twenty yards ahead of me, I decided to push on, really push for it. I picked up the pace and I lengthened my stride, and almost instantly a pain arrived. I kind of say pain, but it, it wasn't like the pain like somebody kicking you in the shin or like as if you were stuck with something sharp like a knife. Not that kind of intense pain. It felt more like the kind of pain you might feel if somebody suddenly punched you in the stomach. All the wind decides to leave your body and suddenly the whole inside of your chest shrinks to half its normal size. Now, you know when something's not right. And, you know, I'm not an elite athlete, but I'd been running long enough to know when something wasn't right with me and um, you know I know my body well and you know I knew when it was working and performing well uh, and I knew when it was struggling uh, and I also know all the little tricks that my mind plays with me the mind games you hear a little voice in your head saying you really need to slow down a little bit now Steve <laughs> you I think you're getting a stitch you know you really need to ease off the pace now I think your legs are going to cramp well this was no trick 
this was no mind game. Something was wrong. It was something I had not experienced before. I slowed the pace right down almost to a walk and I gave up any thought of catching the runners ahead. I needed to figure out what was wrong. Do I have to stop and quit the race? As I slowed to a walk, the pain subsided. After a few minutes, the pain had passed altogether. By now I'd almost reached the top of the hill and the road had started to flatten out. And I was feeling a bit better. I was thinking, what the hell was that all about? I actually said out loud, you know, what was that all about? And the pain had gone as quickly as it arrived, which was a strange thing. And my next thought was, was there still time to speed up and maybe make up a few more places? <laughs> so I pushed hard and I passed two more runners as we entered the last phase of the race. But how much time had I lost? Yeah, that's, that is gripping, just listening to you say that now and just reliving them, you know, you really feel like, you know, the emotions of it. And yeah, I can't imagine how you felt in that moment, but as someone that does a lot of um, training and, and exercise and, um, you know, there's times when I'm training when I am pushing really hard, but I know my body so well, I know the difference between being uncomfortable because, you know, you're pushing yourself to your limits and perhaps, you know, something just not being right with mm. your body. Mm. Um, but that must have been a very, you know, unique feeling at the time. I mean, did you think at all that, oh, I'm having a heart attack, or there's something wrong with my heart? Not at all. There's, no? there's, a, there's a really famous story. You, you, remember, you know the comedy duo, Morecambe and Wise? Yeah. Yeah? Well, obviously, Eric Morecambe, bless him, he had lots of heart problems, and, and ultimately, it killed him. Um, but he told a really funny story about his first time he had a heart attack and he said he was going driving somewhere and he felt unwell and he said he saw a policeman directing traffic and he and he pulled over he was he was somewhere he didn't familiar he wasn't familiar with and he pulled over and he wound the window down and he said to the policeman can you tell me where the nearest hospital is and the, the policeman directed him to the hospital and he shook himself off to the hospital and uh, the, the the interviewer said to him you know did you exactly what you just asked me. He said, did you know you were having a heart attack? Mm. And Eric Morgan famously said, not at all. He said, if I'd have thought I was having a heart attack, I'd have had a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's the clearest way you can put it, I guess. <laughs> so no, to answer your question, no, yeah. I, didn't know, I didn't know what, I honestly didn't know what it was. It had, people often say when you, when you have a heart attack it, or when you have angina or those kind of symptoms where there's a blockage in your heart, it feels yeah. very much like um, intense indigestion. But the thing is, I've always been a pretty fit guy and, and um, I can't ever remember ever having indigestion. Mm -hmm. I, always, I always eat well and I, and I eat properly. I don't, I'm not one of these people that rush about with a sandwich in, in my yeah. hand, you know, running from A to B. And so I've, I've, I've never been in a situation where I've given myself indigestion or I've yeah. had indigestion. I've not even had heartburn or anything like that. So I never had any of those kind of situations mm -hmm. where I could recognize the symptoms so I, I couldn't kind of compare it and say but in my head I was thinking if I had had indigestion maybe this is what it would feel like if okay. it was that kind of feeling you know yeah brilliant okay so would you like to carry on yeah on the okay yep second part so <clears throat> how much time had I lost I duly completed the seven miles and I saw the clock at the finish line <laughs> my time was disappointingly slow my slowest ever for this race. Still, at least I'd made it, and I seem, seem to still be in one piece. I rang my wife to let her know I was okay. How did it go, she asked. Mm, not so good, I said. It was a terrible time, the slowest ever. I don't know what's going on. Anyway, at least I finished the race and I lived to tell the tale. Oh, good, she said. I'll put the insurance policy away then, shall I? <laughs> we both laughed. Prophetic words, yeah? <laughs> I'd gone to the race with my friend Kevin. Uh, he came from our local running club, uh, and all I had to do was drop him back to Brandon, and then it would be straight home for a shower, something to eat, and a chance to put my feet up. We headed off, and at first everything was fine, and we'd only been on the road for about 10 minutes when the pain started again. I took some water, but decided not to say anything to Kevin. And then I started to sweat. I mean, really, really sweat. Water was literally falling into my lap like I was standing in the rain and the intensity of the pain increased. Suddenly, suddenly I knew with an absolute certainty what had happened to me during the race and what was happening to me now. I was having a heart attack. 
There were no sharp pains in the chest, no pain radiating down one arm. I had none of the classic heart attack symptoms, but there was not a shred of doubt in my mind. Kevin, I said, I don't want to worry you, mate, but I think I need to go to the hospital. He took one look at me and I could see the concern in his eyes. He seemed to notice for the first time my lack of colour and the rivers of sweat running down my face. Do you want me to drive, he said. Uh, Kevin was in the US military and he'd only been in the country for a few months. He was still finding his way around. I knew the area and I knew the quickest way to the hospital. No, I'll be okay. I lied. Mm. I didn't feel okay at all. And by the time I arrived at A&E, I was most definitely not okay. My name is Steve Morley. I've been running in a seven mile race and I think I'm having a heart attack. Mm. Yeah, how does that make you feel just like reading that back? How do you feel about that situation and, and since that happened, <clears throat> do you, how has it sort of changed you, would you say? Um, well, quite a lot of water has gone under the bridge since then. Bear in mind, yeah. this was 2010 and we're nine years on now. Um, I Occasionally I read it to people and I, I feel a bit emotional when, I, when I'm reading it. Mm. But the good thing about what happened or one of the good things about what happened was that it, in the year that I took to recover, I had started running again and I promised myself I was going to run the race again. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody said yeah, I had nothing to prove, I shouldn't run the race again but I was determined to kind of get back on the horse. And I describe it in the book as slaying the dragon. I think it's really important, you know, I got, you know, I got trashed by the dragon, mm -hmm. got carted off to hospital. It was really important for me to come back and for round two and, 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 and slay the dragon. So it was really, really important. But you know, the funny thing about it, my, my friend Kevin and my friend Lee, who I run with, both of them ran with me on the race. And they never, I wanted to run my own race, uh, and they said, oh, yeah, we'll let you run your own race. But, you know, they were never too far away. They were always, like, keeping an eye on me during the race. And I got to the hill where I had the heart attack. And I wondered how I would feel um, running up the hill. Mm. And I was running up the hill, and I was trying to remember the exact point going up the hill when, when I had the heart attack. Yeah. And I'm thinking, I think it was here. No, 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 it wasn't here. It was a bit further forward. No, was it here? No, I think, no, it wasn't here. It was... But and then I got to the top of the hill and realised I'd gone all the way up the hill and, <laughs> yeah. and, and didn't couldn't remember where it yeah. was. So, so going up the hill that was funny. That made me laugh out loud. And then I finished the race and burst into tears, which was a bit wimpy of me. And uh, Kevin and Lee were all sort of like Ooh, trying to look, you know, you know, like guys are not very good with that sort of thing. So they were all like looking at the heaven and whistling to themselves yeah, and being of, very awkward about yeah, it. Yeah, being all very awkward. And, <laughs> and but after a few minutes, I pulled myself together. But that was the only bit of emotion. Oh, that I'm sure. Sort of showed, yeah. you know? because you know when you was running, you were being strong, but it must have always been in the back of your mind a little bit. And obviously leading up to that, I mean, how long? Was that how long apart was that from when it happened to doing that race? Well, it was the next year. So it was the next year. So it was mm. almost so it was exactly a year. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I mean, that's an, that's incredible. And you know, when that happened, um, you know, the day after that happened, to think that you would be running back in that same race yeah. next year. I was determined to do that. Yeah, you, you I was determined to do that. When when I um, uh, when I when I was in the hospital, the um, I got taken in on the Sunday, and uh, on the Monday morning, the, the doctor came and did his rounds. And it was the first question I asked the doctor. I said to him, "When can I? When can, can I, I, can I, I book onto that race? When can, yeah. when can I expect to be running again?" Yeah. Um, and he and he laughed out loud and said, "Oh, I see you're feeling a bit better then, Mr. Morning." Yeah. Yeah, it was quite funny. Brilliant. So, have we got one more piece yeah. of extract from that yeah. book that you'd like to read? Yeah, for sure. Okay. So, I booked myself into um, West. Uh, West, West Suffolk, West Suffolk yep. yeah. And um, so to carry on, so everything from then on was a blur. I remember, I vaguely remember a wheelchair being thrust under me and being taken straight in to see the doctors. <laughs> no waiting around for hours in casualty that day. <laughs> <laughs> I remember being asked lots of questions. I didn't really want to answer questions. I felt so, so tired. I just wanted to sleep. And in the end, Kevin was answering most of the questions, bless him. Mr. Morley, we've ordered an ambulance to take you to Papworth, they told me. I'm afraid that you're having a heart attack. Thank you, I managed to say. I'd kind of figured that one out for myself. 
awkward laughter filled the small cubicle. I drifted in and out of consciousness during the ambulance ride. I thought about my wife. I thought about the hospital I was being taken to. Papworth. Papworth. I've heard of Papworth. I'm sure that's the leading heart hospital in the country, right? Yeah, that's got to be a good thing. Hang in there, Steve, I'm thinking. Slow everything down. Conserve your energy. Just breathe. You'll be fine. If only this invisible person would just get off my chest and let me breathe. My thoughts returned to my wife. Somebody must have told her by now. I hope she's not too worried. Did I think about dying? Well, interestingly not, I can honestly say that that thought never occurred to me. The ambulance duly arrived at Papworth and I was taken straight into theatre. White coats, blue gowns, people in masks. I wanted to sleep to close my eyes. They wouldn't let me. Stay with us, a voice said. Stay awake, Stephen. It's the sound of a woman's voice. Try to stay awake if you can. I was being given instructions, explanations of where I was, what was happening to me, what they were going to do. Too much information. Just let me sleep. I had to sign some papers. A clipboard is rested on my chest, a pen placed in my hand. I think they call it a disclaimer. It means that it's not, the, not their fault if I don't make it. I asked for my wife. I signed the papers and the medical team got to work. Thank you very much, Stephen, for reading that, because I know, I mean, that is, you know, that's a, a hell of a thing for anyone to go through. So, you know, the fact that you've, um, you know, written a book about it to help other people and, you know, you've come on here to, to speak about it, um, I think it's amazing. And I think people are going to take a lot from that, just hearing you read those extracts there. So... Yeah, I can't thank you enough for that. Um, so what I'd like to do now is uh, move on to uh, your second book, mm -hmm. which had coming out, So, yep. um, uh, which is called Too Old to Ultra. Yep. So let's just buy, uh, you know, let's just start off giving the, the listeners uh, a bit of information about what that book is. Okay. Well, when I, when I recovered from my, from my heart attack, I, I started running again. Uh, and it took me, I suppose it took me uh, a year, probably just over a year to, to feel that I was fully recovered. Um, and shortly after that, I ran my first post heart attack marathon. Um, and if I rem if memory serves me, it was it was Luton, the Luton marathon, uh, which in itself is a horrible marathon. <laughs> I have to say apologies to anybody who's run the Luton marathon, but it is a horrible marathon. It's, it's like in, in December, it's cold. Um, and it's got lots of hills in it, um, yeah. so it's not a, nice, not a lot of fun. Not a lot of fun. <laughs> no, my favourite marathon is probably um, Milton Keynes because it's nice and flat. Yeah, and it finished, and it finishes in the football stadium, oh, which nice. is great. So as you run around the running track, yeah. you see yourself on the big screen. So that's that's good. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, so I so I I got back and I I I'd, I'd run a couple of marathons and 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 that was that was that was good. I was I was okay doing that and. Um, but I kind of I I I, I was looking to improve, and 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 one of the things that often happens when you get older is you you can you can improve, but you have to change the parameters a little bit. So where running is concerned, you know, forget about trying to improve your five k time. Forget about trying to improve your ten k time because your fast twitch muscles are not there anymore, and it's not going to happen no matter how hard you train. Well, it is going to happen, but it, incrementally, it's you know you're not going to knock mm -hmm. big chunks off your 5k time in your 60s. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. However, the longer you go, the more room for improvement there is. So, you start off doing the five-hour marathon, and you do training and you work hard. You can do a four-hour marathon, and if you push harder and you push harder and you train, you can do like a three and a half-hour marathon. You know. Yeah. With with ultra running, it's a kind of whole different ball game. So you're running longer distances. The, the, whole, the whole thing is kind of slightly different from a marathon in, in, in all sorts of ways. So in a marathon, 26 miles, 26 and a bit miles, you have, you have um, uh, stations, food stations, and invariably they'll have paper, paper cups of water or they might have isotonic drinks or they might have uh, jelly babies or something like that. In an ultramarathon, it's like a running buffet. So it's like pretzels and sausage rolls and crisps <laughs> and peanuts. And Whatever so. you need, just get yeah. the calories in. Because you want the yeah. salt, you want the calories. Yeah. yeah. So it's a whole different ball game. And 
the the marshalling is different because you know in a marathon you've got marshals everywhere every mile or whatever in in ultra marathons they're few and far between mm -hmm. and you you have you have to have rely on running notes so it's a whole different challenge yeah. um and i got just intrigued by the idea of it i thought well i can run 26 miles can i run 30 miles mm -hmm. because technically speaking uh, anything over 32 miles is is classified as an ultra over 32 yeah so what's what about anything in between 26 and 32 what, what, what well, are we talking it, it, there? It, see that it's like it's people's perception of it yeah yeah if you run a lot of people say well i, I did um I think King's Forest is 30 miles. Mm -hmm. That's around where the Anglo-Saxon village is. Yeah. Um, it's just a nice round number for yeah, people, really. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, you know, they, they qualify that as an ultra. Yeah. It depends how strict you want to be. But yeah. if, you read up, if you read up on it, you know, sort of marathon distance is 26.2 or 4, whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, ultra marathon, 32, 32 miles and above qualifies as an ultra okay. so you get a lot of what i call baby marathon baby, baby ultras which are like 32 35 right. 40 yeah uh pedder's way which was the first one that i attempted um that's 47 i think or nearly okay. 48 miles yeah. so there's a lot of them that are about that sort of um distance so i did a couple of the of the shorter ones mm -hmm. uh, to see that i could do it and then i attempted pedders as my as my first adventure or as it turned out my misadventure yeah, yeah okay <laughs> we'll go on to that so in terms of your so just going back so to the first book so a year after you you know you've done that race again mm. um so that would have been what year would that would have been that was uh, 2011 2011 mm. okay um so then from there where did you uh at what point did you do your first ultra marathon at what what uh um, what year was that Can you remember uh 2014 I think 2014 yeah okay yeah and how many have you done all together since then five done five yeah okay okay yeah. um would you like to read the introduction to your book yeah it's much, um for it's, too old to ultra yeah. just to give people a little bit uh, of an insight uh, to the book yeah. um, and then we'll, uh, we'll we'll delve a bit deeper into yeah, it yeah if for anybody who wants to run an ultra it's probably yeah. not the ideal um beginning Okay. Uh, but this is um, this was my um, this was my first experience of an ultra. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and um, it's um, Pedder's Way Ultra Marathon, and I did this on Saturday, the thirty first of January, two thousand and fifteen. Yeah. Uh, the conditions were appalling, and only a last minute decision was made to go ahead with the race. I think a lot of the faster runners wanted to get finished before it gets dark, and before the really bad weather closed in and the temperatures dropped too low. As usual, I went off far too quick and my heart rate was too high. However, I soon settled into the run and I reached the first checkpoint at 13 miles without too much trouble. Having said that, it was very, very wet and muddy underfoot and snow and sleet were falling pretty much from the start. By the time I got to 13 miles, I was setting a reasonable pace, but the next checkpoint wasn't until 26.5 miles, just over half distance, at a place called Castle Acre. Conditions got progressively worse, and at about 17 miles, I found myself running into the face of a blizzard. The sleet was burning my eyes and face. At about 18 miles, I found myself running along the top of an embankment where there were large puddles on the path, all of which were waterlogged, so very muddy. A lot of them were frozen and visibility was poor, so poor in fact that my eyes were watering and in trying to avoid one of the larger puddles I ran to the side and I lost my footing in the mud. As I slipped my foot hit a tree root and over I went. Unfortunately because I was on the edge of the embankment there was nowhere for me to go but down and so I fell headlong into a drainage ditch. Doesn't sound ideal for your first ultra marathon. <laughs> Not a good start. <laughs> Not a good, and how? So how long was this ultra marathon? And how? Forty-seven miles. Forty-seven, and yeah. that was how many miles in? Did you say? Eighteen. That was eighteen miles in. Yeah. Okay. So I had to. So it was all hop. going well till then. Yeah. It was all going well. Yeah, I'd settled into my run. I was. Yeah. I was okay. I was feeling okay. Okay. Um, I had done. I had wrecked the race. Um, over the previous weeks and months. Yeah. So so what we what we used to do is is we would we would break the ultra into sections and this is what i still do break it into sections yeah go with a friend 
and then uh, the friend would, would, would drop me off and then would drive okay. 20 miles yeah. to the next, and then so that I would run that 20 miles yeah. of the ultra as a training run okay. and then get in the car and go home. Okay. And yeah. then the next week we would go and we would go from that 20 mile to the, to the, to the finish. Yeah? yeah, yeah. Or if it was a longer ultra, we would do it in like 15 mile chunks. Okay. So we do it over a period of weeks. Um, so you get to know the route. Yeah. But the thing about the, the ultras, because of the, particularly pedders, because of the time of year, um, it gets dark. Yeah. So you're running the last stretches of it. A little head torch on. We have a head torch on, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and everything that looks fine and dandy in the daytime mm. looks completely different at night. I can imagine that gives you confidence, though, like, you know, instead of just doing your training, you know, random location, um, even though you're getting the distance in, I think there's a certainly a psychological, I imagine, like, a, uh, you know, it gives you, like, a bit of an edge, knowing you've ran this before, even though it's not the entire run but knowing that you've actually hit this section before and you know that can also give you an idea of time and pacing so so when you're looking at um running that 47 miles uh, did you have a, a goal in terms of time and how did you work out what pace you needed to, to go for okay. that race well that was my first one so I, bas I basically just wanted to finish it yeah and and it's a it's a strange thing about ultra marathons um in, in as much as in many ways, they're very generous. They 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 seem very daunting, mm. but but they're very generous in the amount of time they give you to complete it. Mm -hmm. So so in the case of pedders, I think I think the cutoff time is about twelve hours, and if you do the math, you could actually work out that you could almost walk it in that time. You know, mm -hmm. stepping out, you yeah. could you could almost walk it. Um, so you know, if you can if you can run a bit and, and walk when you need to, and run a bit and walk when you need to, you can kind of do it. Um, providing you prepare for it and um, so my 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 just my intention was to was to finish it and that mm -hmm. was the thing but the, here's the thing about that first ultra it I probably should have not run it because the weather conditions were really bad and leading up to the race it was heavy snow and cold and 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 they kept posting on social media stay tuned we may have to cancel yeah. stay tuned we may have to cancel and lots of people dropped out lots of people said oh, I'm not doing this it's ridiculous so when we got there on the day, out of a, about uh, 250 people that had put to enter, there was only about 120 people. So a whole load of people had dropped out. And even then it was like, oh, what should we do? What should we do? The organizers were in a little huddle. And in the end, they did the worst possible thing they, they could do. They asked us. So of right. course they're saying, who'd like to carry on? And of course, Nobody wants to like put their hands in their pockets. Everyone's everybody, there. They've turned up. Yeah, they're ready to go. Yeah, everybody puts their hand up. Yeah. What they should have done is taken responsibility and said, "Look, I'm sorry, guys. We've had a talk about this. We've had a look at the weather that's coming. Yeah. We're going to cancel it. Really sorry." Instead of which, they, "What do you want to do, guys?" So we all set off, and snow got heavier and heavier. I'd got to 18 miles. I had to go from 18 miles to to, to 23 miles. Uh, hobbling mm -hmm. um, I got lost several times because the snow had covered all the markers over there were there were no marshals there and the, the funniest thing and, and not being ultra critical of, of the organizers but when I told people I was going to do it they said oh well what about your safety and I said well they must look after you um, probably what they do um, maybe you'll get a chip or something so maybe they'll be able yep. to monitor you see where you are and, just in and, case you know you've fallen down this drainage ditch or oh, number 604 hasn't moved for the last 20 minutes <laughs> yeah. maybe we should send somebody to make yeah. sure he's okay yeah and one of the elite runners maybe they come back or yeah. someone on a bike or something come and look for you no forget it none of that the funniest thing was when when we when i got to the halfway part part I, all i was thinking was there'll be a nice checkpoint with hot soup and mm -hmm. coffee and everything yeah. and when i got to the halfway they'd packed it all up it had all been packed up and so there was a pub and I went to the pub and the marshals that had been marshalling the, the, the halfway were in the pub having their dinner. And when I came <laughs> through the door, covered in snow and freezing, blue lips, the lady in between eating the food, she, she stopped eating, she picked up her mobile phone and she said, hello, control, number 604 has just come in. <laughs> How many is it now we're missing? Really? Yeah, wow. seven people. Got that's not what I like. You say that's not what I thought at all. I thought it would have been much, 
better organised than Seven that. people got hyper- hypothermia. Wow. A whole load of people dropped out. And they had, they had um, basically put a cutter. They brought the cut-off point yeah. forward right. because the weather had got so bad. Yeah. So I couldn't have continued at that point, even if yeah. I'd have wanted to, because they... You know, they said, no, yeah. we're, not, we're not letting it. any more runners come through. We're not letting them continue yeah. because the snow had got so bad. So, you know, it was what it was. Really. So since doing your other four, do you now re- realise that, OK, this one in particular just wasn't ran well? Or is there a common I, theme I, it, with it, ultras? I think... Is that you are always going to be a little bit vulnerable? I think you are encouraged to be self-reliant. And, right. And... You, you need to be self-reliant so the, the, it's really important to have a team it, it's not like I mean I've done marathons before I've just taken myself off on my own and run them yeah. parked the car run the marathon drove and driven home again um, but for something like an ultra you need a support team so you know like you need a good friend or you know like a, my brother-in-law or somebody like that who and you plan it out so that they they're at a lay-by on the side yeah. of the A1 or whatever. You need that extra support. The, 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 100%. The, 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 one of the things, uh, one of the ultras, I think it might have been Pedders again. There was two, there were two people, a young woman and a young, and a man. Both of them evenly matched. One finished and one didn't. Mm-hmm. And the last checkpoint is about 13 miles before the finish. And when I did it in the recce, I said to the person I was running with, "If I can get here, I'll finish it." because I know where I'm going to let the last 30 miles beat me. If I can get here, I'll, I'll crawl the last 30 miles, don't care. Yeah. <laughs> and the boy didn't finish it, and the girl did. And the difference was, the boy got there, there was nobody to help him. He had a coffee, hot coffee, ran 400 yards, turned around and walked back. Mm-hmm and rang up and said come and get me I can't do it I just can't do it yeah Yeah. the girl had her husband or partner I can't remember in a car she had a hot coffee she took the hot coffee into the car right lovely warm car she changed her shoes put nice clean warm socks on Mm -hmm. she took off her top put a new warm top on got her gloves off put nice warm gloves on and she sat there for 20 minutes getting warmed up yeah before getting out of the car and then going again nailing the last 13 miles yeah and that was the difference just having that little bit just having that little bit i imagine for some people though that may have um having that comfort and that warmth would have made it even harder to get back back out there it, it depends have, on your personality it does I well there's a famous there's a famous uh, ultra that goes along like the length of hadrian's wall and um and that's like uh that's like an all-nighter yeah and uh, a friend i have not run it but a friend of mine who ran it said that uh, a van comes along in the middle of the night, early hours of the morning, a van mm. comes along and 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 stops, and o- they, they open the doors, and you, you get in, and you can have hot coffee and things, yeah. and they're warm. And he said, you know, I got in, and you know, they, they drive along a little bit further, you know, pick up the next group, and and he's sitting there, and then the guy the guy said, well, I can't keep driving you down, you know, you're going to have to get out and get or, out. or stay. And, yeah. And he said, and they opened the doors, and he had that. Shall <laughs> that I? little moment yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and he said no, I was every fiber of my body just wanted to say no you're all right I'll, I'll stay oh, yeah and and he said and no, I, I took all my willpower to 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 get out of the car yeah and he said but ironically once I was out within a few minutes of being out I was all right again it's just that little moment it's it's a uh, it's a bit like um I've been watching that SAS special forces oh, right, program yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and they do that a lot when with the training you know they say oh it's fine if you know if you just want to if you, you want to hand your, your your number in now and you know we've got some tea and cake in here and you can just chill out with us it's, yeah, you know yeah. if you don't want to do it it's fine yeah. and they use them tactics of yeah, yeah. trying to give you know this you can have this is comfort you've got yeah. warm tea here you've got a nice bit of cake yeah. or you can go and run another you know 10 miles yeah. in the cold absolutely. but yeah you can see you can see what happens so yeah, absolutely so let's uh i think let's carry on from when you went down the ditch have you got a little bit more um i, on I, that? I i'll have to just pre- press it because i didn't i didn't yeah. print out anything. no no worries that's um, fine so if you could just so you so you go down that ditch yeah um and you said about you had to hobble along i mean had you injured yourself? What what happened at that point? Yeah, it, I did. It was I was really lucky. I got I got I got to the ditch, bottom of the ditch, and, and like I was staring up at like snowflakes like falling on my on my face, gently falling on my face. Yeah, I, everything was quiet, still. You couldn't hear anything, and then and then I kind of had to just think right. 
have I hurt myself? Is anything broken? Yeah. And I kind of, I sort of move my fingers and move my toes and, and everything moved. Everything seemed to work okay. So I kind of got myself up achy and then I had to retrieve all my stuff because my, my water bottle had gone one way and another bottle had go and things had come out of my utility belt. I had my utility belt stuffed with like Mars bars and, yeah. and, and energy bars and energy gels and things and they'd all gone everywhere. So <laughs> I had to collect all these things and then, yeah. and then clamber up this, this, this side of this ditch and, and halfway up I realised my foot was really sore. I was hurt. I'd obviously hurt my thing and I sort of, I started to run and it was too painful to run. Right. So I knew I couldn't. I knew I'd sprained it or strained it or, or something, and I had nothing to strap it up with. Yeah. Um, and um, so I, I I persevered, but I kind of knew at that point I was I was probably not going to be able to finish. Yeah. Um, so I had a mobile phone with me, and I um, I phoned up my um, my son-in-law. Yeah. And I said I, I said. Um, I need you to come to Castle Acre. I'm going to try and make you know get to Castle Acre and you, for you to pick me up there, uh, which is which is what he did. Yeah. Um, but as I say, I was very disappointed in the fact that what was sustaining two things were sustaining me. One was I knew that Rob was um, on his way to pick me up, um, so I knew I was get it. That was fine. Someone was coming to get me. And the second thing was the thought of having like this nice hot soup to. Um, you know, to, to kind of re energize me. Yeah. And, and, and what was so disappointing was that when I got there, it, it, there was nothing there. It had all been packed away. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was the, that was the hardest thing really. That, yeah. that was worse than falling down it, the ditch. Yeah, that's right. Just not, but fortunately the pub was open. So I was able to Perfect. go to the pub and I, and I, I happy I, days. You could make things a little bit better. Yeah. In there. I, I didn't have any beer. I just got a big mug of coffee. <laughs> Perfect. Just to warm you up. Yeah. Good. So one thing uh, that I wanted to ask you about, uh, Stephen, was the the physical uh, effects. Uh, if we start with that, the physical effects of doing ultra marathons um, on the body, the the positive in terms of you know cardiovascular benefits, um, and you know how incredibly fit you can get and increasing your endurance, but also is there a detrimental effect on the body in terms of longevity of completing ultra marathons and. And you know what is the sort of the, the, the science uh, behind that, or what do you know about it? Well, the, the jury is still out on long distance running. It's it's in fact the jury's out on on running full stop. Really, I think most most people in the medical profession uh, would agree that exercise is good for you. I don't think there's yeah. any any question on that. And I think most people would say that that running is good for you. When you're doing a lot of running, whether that's a lot of heavy training or whether you're running long distances, then you've got to think about just the physical um, stress on your joints for a start. I mean, I was talking to somebody at the gym recently who was about to do a marathon and was so disappointed because they'd started getting knee, knee problems. Um, and when I spoke to them, it, it was basically the fact that they'd been doing all their training on the pavement yeah. and on the roads. So, you know, I'm really lucky where I live because I can run around the Warren in Lakenheath. So when Lee and I used to do our long runs, we used to do laps of the Warren. So you had the benefit that it was nice and soft underfoot, so you weren't putting too much um, strain on your joints. But because it was undulating, it was helping your core strength and your yeah. balance. And, and so it, had, it, was, it was good in that, re in that respect. But doing long, long distances, um, there are a lot of studies that say it's, it's not good for you. I always compare like running an ultra to running a marathon, and I, I actually maintain that running an ultra is not as... Uh, detrimental to your health potentially as running a marathon because when you run a marathon when you get when you get to the point where you're getting four hour marathons three and a half hour marathons three hour marathons you know you are doing 10 minute nine minute eight minute miles and most marathons are done on the road yeah so for 26 miles even if you're only running at like eight minute mile pace you're actually putting quite a big strain on your body and on your heart. Mm -hmm. If you run an ultra, you're not running at eight minute mile pace. You know, you're running at maybe you're running at 10 minute mile pace, 11 minute mile pace, 12 minute mile pace. So although you're running farther, you're not running as fast. Yeah. And also, unless you're an elite ultra runner, you're often walking quite a lot of the time mm -hmm. as well. So your heart rate comes down because you're walking, you know, you recover you go again so overall even though you're running a lot longer 
you're not putting as big a strain on your body yeah. as you were you know it's it's a bit you know it's like jogging 400 meters or, know, or sprinting flat out to for 100 meters it's know? almost more natural to the human body in terms of it involves walking and it, you know you are um depending on the route you're doing you might have to go up some hills uh, it's flat it, it can be it's it's a very varied experience for your body uh, and yeah. You, yeah there are some intense moments in there where you are going to be maxing your heart rate up but you are going to be bringing things back yeah. down yeah. and it's more of a longevity thing it was interesting i listened to a podcast recently and there's a guy uh, called ross edgley who swam around the uk mm -hmm. and if you look at him he looks like a power lifter he's very mm. muscular mm. very broad he's like looks really heavy mm -hmm. and the guy who was interviewing him said uh, don't take offense to this but you don't look like a swimmer i'm very surprised that your body shape looks like this and you've swam around the uk i was expecting mm. someone to be sort of tall lean more athletic, more athletic. Mm. but the way he described it was um he was imagining uh, and picturing himself as like a whale yes. going round the UK, but a very slow pace, but just very consistent mm. and being very durable um, mm. and obviously having extreme like mental strength mm. because most of the time his head was in the water um, and it was just a, amongst his own thoughts, yeah. which can be really tough. Yeah. Um, so that's what I'd like to go on to... The, the, the mental side of, of running an ultra marathon, which mm. is equally as challenging as getting in physical uh, shape. So in terms of when you're training for a marathon, in terms of mentally, are you doing anything to you know help and improve your mental strength? Is that something that you've always found easy? Um, do you keep your mind clear or do you think about things to make the time go fast? What's your approach with, with that? Okay, so one of, the, one of the training things that I do uh, is is bizarre really because it doesn't involve any running at all um, mm -hmm. one of the things that I do at least once or twice when I'm training for a for an ultra is I go out all day and I'm on my feet the whole day so I, I pick myself a route that ideally is a big loop um, that's maybe 20 plus miles in a, in a loop um, and the only time I jog is to relieve the boredom. Mostly I just walk. So I, I'm just walking and, and I'm out all day. So I might leave home at eight in the morning with the intention that I won't be back. It will take me all day to, to get back home mm -hmm. again. Yeah. Um, and because it's a loop, I have to do it. So it's no point doing like small loops because you, you know, you want to do eight loops and after you've done four, you think, oh, that'll do for today. You know, because you're actually coming past your house again. Yeah. You think, do I really want to go out again? Whereas if you do a big loop, you get to the point of no return where it's actually taking you less time you to come yeah. back than if you turn around and go back yeah. out again. So you might as well just keep going because you've got to get home, haven't you? You've got okay. to get back home. That's usually the time when I run. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I just, I'm time like, to get home. I want to go home now. Yeah, you know? so, I start, so I start running. But but just being on your feet all day yeah that is really good mental uh, training uh knowing for, you can do ultras. it just yeah. knowing you can do yeah. it yeah for sure but um but yeah the mental side of it is 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 very hard um because often it's very lonely unless you're unless you're the one of the first run runs i did um i got quite friendly with a girl on facebook who was who was doing it and we got you know exchange face and i made the fatal mistake of actually saying to her do you fancy running it together and we'll support one another? And she was very polite and diplomatic, but she basically said no. And she, and she explained why. And she said, because you, you, you get into this head place where if, 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 you're, if you're struggling and somebody's saying, no, come on, we can do it together, it, it gets irritating and, and you get aggressive and angry with something, you mm -hmm. know. Um, but then you feel that if they're struggling, you feel like you've got to slow down and support them, and and it it really messes your head up, and and yeah. Yeah. And she said <laughs> too many ups and downs. Yeah. Yeah. She said makes sense. If we find that we happen to be running together, and we're having a little chat, and we, we actually find we're then fine. Mm. But let's not do it as a plan. Yeah. Because you know, if you have to drop out, yeah. then do I feel like I've got to drop out as well? 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'll, no, we'll go back together. You know, or we, don't worry about it. Or, you know, it, it, it messes with your brain. So yeah. she said to me, you know, you have to do it on your own. You can't, you can't do it with a buddy really. Um, so all the ones I've done, I've done one. I've tried to get Mr. Lee to come with me, and he just thinks I'm crazy. <laughs> thinks so, you're mad. Yeah. yeah so he, yeah, he's yeah. not going to do it. But but okay. but it is it is a fascinating thing because you say about the, the the doing the ultras and the ups and downs and things. It's much more authentic, like original hunter gatherers, isn't it? You know where yeah. where people used to leave and and go for almost for hundreds of miles chasing yeah. prey. Yeah. And sometimes you know they'd run them down, so they'd be running. Yeah. And other times it's a, it's they'd just mixture. be they'd yeah. just be walking. Yeah, you know, uh, I know what you mean because with a marathon, it is and you know half or a full marathon, it's a hard yeah. pace yeah. and it's a relentless pace for a long period of yeah. time, and that yeah. does really make sense. Absolutely, yeah, and and it takes its toll on yeah. you. I mean, that's why they they say it takes a, a good month to recover from a marathon. Yeah. yeah, you know, I've I've done an ultra, and I've run a marathon two weeks later. Right, so you tend to recover faster from that mm. longer distance. Yeah. It's got to be just that intensity. Yeah. Like you say, it's, yeah. it's that intensity yeah. that you put on your and, body. And everything about it is relative, you know. I mean, I'm not yeah. a Scott Jurek. I'm not, you know, I'm not running 100 miles in I don't know how many hours. You know, I'm, you know, it, it, it takes me a lot, a lot longer to do yeah. it. I, I take my consolation and my pride in the accomplishment of doing it because it used to be you did a marathon and people would go, wow, good job, yeah. so in awe of you. Now everybody does marathons, don't they? Yeah. You know, um, so, you, you know, if, if you want that good feeling and you need to up the stakes a little bit. Yeah. So if you want the bragging rights, you need to say, well, I've done a 60 miler or I've done an 80 miler or, you know. In a very humble way, obviously. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, and I suppose with ultra running, people, I don't know what. I mean, what sort of person generally do you think it attracts the the ultra marathon runner? Sometimes I mean, is there a common? Well, is a there lot, a common thing? Have they, you, no, have you noticed? Theory, yeah, there yeah. is. A, there is a theory. If you if you go onto the forums, because um, there's a lot of ultra running running forums, so you will find a lot of troubled people. Right, you so it's like an escapism type thing. It's you'll that feel a lot of people relentless that have had, pursuit for something. You'll find a lot of people who have had dark a dark history. You feel a lot right. of people. You find a lot of people who met, who who, um, who do ultras have had mental health issues. Yeah. Now, obviously, some people say well, they, they need to have a mental health problem to contemplate running that far <laughs> anyway. Yeah. But, but if you if you see people, it's it's a generalisation, but you, it's surprising how many people you do yeah. do find who are. Uh, you know, a little bit antisocial, m misfits. Yeah. People who don't, you know, gel well with with other people. They seem to be a bit. It's a, bit a very runners. individual. Um, yeah, it's a yeah. very individual pursuit, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. I mean, it is. Yeah. yeah, and it and and it's a different crowd from from generally in marathon running and running generally. Yeah. When when you you know I I've been running for for years now and and I love the crowds and I love the people and what I love is the genuine. Um, you know, good naturedness of, of, of running. I yeah, always say support. to people, you know, you run a 10k and the marshals are brilliant and, and the crowds are brilliant and, and the, the man who comes in absolutely dead last or the lady who, who staggers are getting in, clapped in. Yeah, are getting more yeah. cheers than the winners. Yeah. And I remember doing a 10k once and it was one of the very first ones I'd done and, and you know, you know yourself, you, your, your marker with a 10k is like getting under the hour, isn't it? If you get under the hour, that's 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 your first major achievement and i remember the first time i got like 58 minutes or something for the thing and i and i was talking to this guy and he was from uh, cambridge and coleridge athletic club i remember he had a white t-shirt with the cambridge and coleridge that's one of the top running clubs in cambridge and he said to me how'd you get on i said oh, i'm so so chuffed i said uh, i've got a pb and he said um, he said uh, what did you do? And I said, I managed to get under the hour. I did 58 something minutes. And he said, well done, well done. He was genuinely pleased for me. And I said, Just a bit. And I said how did you get on? And he said, oh, I was like about 34 or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and did you just walk off at that point? <laughs> yeah. yeah, he finished in the top sort of 10, you know, yeah. he'd done 34 minutes. At least he was humble though. Well done, yeah, good yeah. job. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you know, and he, but it was, he was almost as, just as pleased that I got under the yeah. hour as he was with so his So generally, the, the high, when the miles go up, the uh, people the, get the, more. People get a bit more 
edgy. bit more intense, a bit more edgy, bit more edgy. Yeah, I can imagine because it's a it's a serious thing that people and people have been put. You know, if you run an ultra marathon, you're not. I mean, maybe you get some crazy people that just wing it, but most people have put a lot yeah. of time and work and dedication yeah. in, and they want to do well. Yeah. You know, and they you can't, you well. can't, you just simply can't wing it. It's no, too, it's too far to go. It's too far. Yeah, yeah. you know, you can't, you can't even walk it. So, and wing it. if anyone's listening who's a bit of a keen runner but fancies an ultra, mm. have you got any tips? Buy any? my book. Buy your book. There you go. <laughs> Let's end the podcast now. Buy the book. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Buy your book. Yeah. Love it. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 uh, it's funny actually. It's it's, it's really really funny because as um, since since I've been sort of if you like promoting the book, yeah, I, I got asked to do a talk. Okay, and uh, I, I I do a lot of public speaking, but it's it's normally around the the, the work that I do f- for a living. You know, right. it's around disability or mental health or equality or and diversity and the sort of stuff that I do from day to day. Yeah, not about my running. And I got asked to do this talk by uh, a running association in uh, in North Norfolk who had a big awards evening and uh, I think you know historically they probably have quite well known runners yeah and um and uh, I got asked I think maybe someone let them down and uh, I got asked to do it and and uh, the the lady I got copied in inadvertently got copied in on the emails and uh, the lady who was organising the whole event yeah. was talking to the lady who had organised the speaker, i.e. me. Okay. And she said, have you managed to get a speaker? And the lady said, yeah, 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 I've got a guy. Um, he's going to come and talk to us. And she said, who is he? She says, a guy called Steve Morley. Uh, he's promoting a book that he's written. Oh, sounds great. Today. Is he an international runner? N- not really. Okay. Is, was he a county runner? I think he might have used to be a county runner, but he's a, a, a senior runner. He's an old runner, older runner, older man. Oh, so she started to get a bit, mm, really. She said, um, what's he going to talk about? She said, he's going to talk about how he had a heart attack while he was running a race. <laughs> it was <a> pause. <laughs> he's going to lighten the mood. Yeah, she said, Yeah. They do, he does know it's an award ceremony, doesn't he? No, he knows it's not. Like oh, a, he knows, yeah. A, a meeting of uh, Runners Anonymous, you know, running can yeah. ruin your health. So she says, no, no, he's going to talk about how he recovered from his heart attack and now he went on to do ultra running. So she's yeah. like, okay, that sounds, sounds great. Better. And yeah. then And then I told my friend Lee, I said, um, they've asked me to do this run, this um, this talk. And he said to me, he said to me, you? And I said, yeah, why not me? And I said, <laughs> I said, I, I know I can't run as fast as sort of, you know, Olympic runners. And he said, Steve, you can't run as fast as Olympic stadiums. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, so yeah. anyway, I did, I did the talk and it, and it, and it went very well. They, yeah. they, they enjoyed the talk and I think um, good. they took some inspiration from it. So Are we having you back? Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully, yeah. Mm great right let's finish there um i really appreciate you coming on steve and talking about your two books uh like i say really inspirational stuff and good luck with the next book when is it out i'm hoping to get it out next month in march next month yeah. okay yeah. cool and will that be available amazon yep. like your yep. book? Am- amazon and barnes and noble okay cool yeah nice uh, one and available as an ebook and then as a paperback yeah. Okay, cool. And I'll be putting all the um, the, the links and stuff uh, when I post the podcast as well. Fantastic. So, yeah, thanks again, mate. I My really pleasure. appreciate it. Yeah. All right, Great cool. Stuff. Cool, guys. Hope you enjoyed the episode, and I'll catch you guys soon. Peace.